First of all, I um, just want to go ahead and get started and welcome everybody to our webinar this afternoon. Uh, the title of this is Navigating Your Business Through COVID-19. Um, I am Laura McClendon. For those of you who don't know me, I am Senior Vice President for Strategic Initiatives and also Chief of Staff here at the Chamber. Um, obviously, I am dialing in from home like so many of you are, are probably also working at a distance um, as we sort of navigate this crisis, others of you are trying to uh, navigate other ways of working, and, and we certainly understand that. So thank you for bearing with us as we um, come to you from lots of different locations. Um, did want to take a moment and talk a little bit briefly about what the Chamber is trying to do to keep you informed and provide resources to both our members, but also to our broader community at this time as, as we all work through um, some of the shifting landscape that's around us. We do have a resource page, as many organizations do, on our website. You can access that by going to montgomerychamber.com slash COVID-19. Uh, you'll find a, a variety of different resources there. We're trying to make sure to not only post updates with regard to public health orders, but also updates with regard to any um, legislative action, any announcements by any federal or state agencies. We're aggregating that all in one place for um, anyone that wants to access it, essentially. We're also um, compiling a variety of different business continuity resources of all different kinds that you can find on that particular page as well. And then beyond that, um, we're even including ways that you can support other local businesses during this time. Uh, you'll find a number of different links that link you out to various different resources, whether it's, you know, restaurants that are offering curbside service to other um, entities that are maybe operating under abbreviated hours or alternate work schedules, but that you can still access their services. Um, so with that, I want to first say thank you so much to our panelists that we have here with us today. Um, we're so lucky to have a diverse group with us that can talk about a variety of different aspects of navigating your business uh, with us this morning. Um, first, we have Dr. David Thrasher. Uh, Dr. Thrasher is a partner with Montgomery Pulmonary Consultants and serves in quite a few capacities throughout our community, one of which is his work with the Baptist Infectious Disease Committee, which of course is very relevant to where we find ourselves right now. Um, in addition to his medical career and, and the expertise that comes with that, he is also a business owner and has quite a bit of experience on that front. Um, and as most of us are continuing to stay engaged with local news updates and, and announcements locally, I also wanted to point out that Dr. Thrasher recently joined uh, Mayor Stephen Reed to provide his expertise and insights during an, an update uh, to the public about some of the anticipated impacts from COVID-19. Um, next, we have Willie Durham. Willie is uh, not only our most recent chairman, uh, chamber chairman, but he is, of course, also a small business owner with a very well-known state farm agency here in Montgomery. Um, so like a good neighbor, Willie, we are glad you're mm -hmm. here. Um, as always this afternoon, um, a lifelong resident of Montgomery and really an incredible advocate for uh, our small business community. So Willie, thank you so much. Thank always you. To see you. Um, and finally, we have Nan Lloyd. Uh, Nan is a certified public accountant with expertise on public accounting, tax compliance, tax planning, business consulting, and business operations. Um, she is the owner and operations manager of Associated Business Solutions. Um, Nan's also a longtime chamber member and a longtime advocate for the business community in Montgomery. So we're, we're very excited to have her on our panel as well. Um, specifically, her firm offers business services um, for both small to medium sized businesses and um, their accounting division specializes in accounting, payroll, um, tax processing, income tax, business consulting, and tax planning services. So. Um, a jack of all trades, uh, Nan, we're very happy to have you with us as well. Um, so before we go to our panelists, really quickly, I wanted to say a quick word about our format. Um, we will first hear individually from each of our panelists, then we'll move into a question and answer session as time permits. 
So if you would like to ask a question of our panelists, um, we ask that you please do that and submit those via the chat feature on your screen. Um, once we arrive at the Q&A session, we will direct those questions directly at specific panelists for dis consideration. Um, and of course, if, if there's a panelist discussion, we'll, we'll certainly allow that as well. Um, and if your question is for a specific panelist in particular, we just ask that you indicate that um, in the chat section when you're submitting your question. So um, at that point, we'll move into closing remarks and we will work to end um, promptly at 4 p.m. as promised. So um, Dr. Thrasher, I would like to begin with you. Um, as I mentioned, you have played a key role thus far given your involvement both in, you know, in the medical community with our public health officials, elected officials, and your advice for the general public. So I would like to turn it over to you to maybe provide us sort of a, a status update of where things are and also talk a little bit about you know, how you've seen this impact your business and, and your advice for those that have joined us today. Sure, and thank you for having me here. Nobody predicted that this pandemic was going to change the world the way it has. I've been working on this really since uh, late February. I've been tracking the COVID cases since then. I'm on several of the COVID task force and communication with our local state as well as our national uh, task force. In February, I was tasked with making a decision of whether or not to recommend to a group of Americans whether or not to uh, attend a huge reunification ceremony in Austria. It's the largest uh, and oldest uh, conservation organization uh, in the world. On February 28th, there was one case of COVID in Salzburg. Two weeks later, it cl climbed about 14. I recommended to our group then that we should not go. Yeah, it was not met with enthusiasm, to say the least, in Austria. I was called uh, a foolish and an arrogant American. Today, there are over 13,000 cases in Austria. They, they've uh, taken over hospitals and turned them into COVID-only uh, uh, hospitals, and the death rate there is staggering. Now, Confucius told us to know the future, study the past. My group saw the very first COVID patient in Alabama was here in Montgomery a little less than a month ago. Ironically, on that very day, the World Health Organization declared this to be a worldwide pandemic. Ironically, 102 that 102 years earlier, almost to the day, a private walked into Fort Riley, Kansas with a sore throat, headache, and uh, later would be a, a diagnosis of flu. By noon that day, over 100 soldiers were admitted to Fort Riley, Kansas, what would be later called the Spanish flu. But why was it called the Spanish flu? Well, we're in the middle of World War I. The press was censored. Uh, they could not report on anything that would hurt the war effort, and the number of casualties would definitely hurt the war effort. So Spain, unfortunately, uh, got, got that uh, distinction because they were neutral in World War I and they did not have censorship of the press. And so all the numbers kept coming out of Spain and people thought that's where it originated. In truth, it should have been called the U.S. flu or the Kansas killer. Now, after that initial outbreak, outbreak in Fort Riley, uh, we, we sent our, our troops that, uh, later in the summer over to France to fight in World War I. Over 100,000 people died in America between March and, and, and that time. Once it hit Europe, it spread like wildfire. It went all over the world. Eight million people died in Spain alone that summer. More, more, so, more soldiers uh, died from the Spanish flu than were died in combat. The Spanish flu would go on to kill more people than all the wars in the 20th century put together. Now, when that, their flu started in, in March, and so did ours. It started going through the summer. We're not in our summer yet. As the troops started coming back in the, in the summer of 1918, the second wave was, would hit us. It was much more deadly. In a three-month period, it was, a, it, was a, it was the worst death uh, of any of that period of two years. As the soldiers kept coming back, cities handled that different. And this is an important part for us. I will give you two examples. One city did it wrong, one city did it right. In Philadelphia, the mayor would not listen to the medical experts. He said, we're not gonna close the schools, we're not gonna close the factories, and indeed he had a victory parade. He said, you keep your feet warm, feet, excuse me, feet dry and, you, and yourself warm and your bowels open, you'd be okay. Well, he even had a victory parade against advice. Three days after that victory parade in September of 1918, all 31 hospital beds in Philadelphia were overflowing with Spanish flu and over 3,000 people died. Within that month, tens of thousands would go on and die. 
that was Philadelphia. St. Louis did it right. The mayor listened to the medical experts. He closed the schools. He closed the factories. He forbid anybody uh, to, to meet out in public uh, with more than 20 people. Their death rate was one eighth of that of uh, um, Philadelphia. And that's kind of what we're trying to do here. Now there'd be a third wave later that, that, that year. And by 1919, when the, when the flu petered out, over 650,000 Americans and over 50 million people worldwide wow. would, be, uh, would be dead. 28% of the public of the world, excuse me, wow. the public of the United States were infected. The population at that time was in America was 100 million, it's 300 million now. I want to talk just a second about the treatment options. I'm not going to get into this because this is more for a medical talk. But the bottom line is you, you've heard uh, uh, Dr. Fauci and the president talk about the plaquenil zithromax combination. And I'm not going to get into that right now. If there's a question, I'll try to answer that. There is a study that we just closed at UAB on a Gilead drug that could, could be a game changer. We don't know. It, it was uh, effective in SARS, but this is a different animal here. All right, well, who can get COVID-19? The quick answer is everybody is vulnerable. In Montgomery, we've had a neonate, a 38-year-old female, a pregnant lady, an 80-year-old, and many, uh, many in between. The very first uh, patient uh, that was intubated on a ventilator in Alabama, uh, I actually happened to see at Jackson Hospital, and uh, he's still alive, but he's hanging by, by his fingernails. He's 50 years old. Now, the studies out of China suggest that suggested the death rate was 10% if you had heart disease, 7% with diabetes, and 6% with uh, high blood pressure. Over the age of 60 is a major risk factor. Smoking is a huge risk factor. In China, 75% of men over 65 smoke. Less than 2% of women that age smoke. The number of men over 65 that died in their pandemic uh, was much, much higher than, than the women. Renal disease and high blood pressure are also major factors. Now, I want to say that COVID-19 is incredibly infectious. Uh, as opposed to SARS, we believe that COVID patients are infected, or excuse me, are contagious one to two days before they even know they have it. And that's a problem. That's what we, it's going to be hard to, to stamp out. Now, SARS, on the other hand, were not contagious until uh, the, the infected person was five days down the road, so it was a lot easier for them to uh, uh, be detected and quarantined. I've been asked, is it seasonal? Will it die out in the summer? Can you develop the immunity? Well, SARS and MERS, um, the, the Middle East uh, uh, Respiratory Syndrome that most of y'all probably haven't heard about, it did not die out in the summer months. Now, as you know, flu in North and South America is seasonal. It usually slows down or dies out completely in the summer month. However, in tropical countries, flu goes year round. So the answer is we do not know. Right now, uh, COVID-19 is uh, rampant in, in, in uh, the Philippines, Indonesia, and uh, Africa. So the answer is we do not know. Now, do you develop immunity? There's some, there's some monkey studies that suggest that, uh, yes, you do. You, you can develop at least uh, some immunity. Can you get it again? Unfortunately, yes. There have been uh, patients who have been, uh, uh, had the, the virus, tested negative and then got reinfected later on. Whether they're uh, getting sick or contagious, we do not know that. Now, how many would die and where are we today? As of last, um, well, as of today, I've been tracking this for 37 days, okay? Like I said, my first task force was, was looking at Austria. There's one, there's one case in Salzburg that day, there's 13,000 today. There were none in Argentina because we planned an uh, event there as well. Today, there's 2,000. Worldwide today, 1.3 million people are infected in the U.S., 368,000. In Alabama, a little over 2,000. And uh, Montgomery, uh, as of this morning, it's up now, is 71. Okay, what's the death rate on confirmed cases? And hear me, that's confirmed cases. There are a lot of cases out there that are mild. We don't know. We're not counting. But confirmed cases, the death rate worldwide is over 5%. Death rate in confirmed cases in the U.S. is 2.5. Well, you've been hearing what's been ha happening uh, in New York. Now, when testing becomes more available, the death rate will go down. Uh, I predict when it's all said and done, it, it'll probably be between 1% and 2%. Now, right now, 
or let me say two days as of two days ago in New York, 150 people die every day, uh, every day. And uh, uh, that is slowing down and that is good. Now the president predicted that between 100 and 200,000 people would die of this. I tend to agree with that. That's probably what's going to uh, happen. Uh, I track this, these figures every morning from an epidemiological standpoint. Uh, today is predicting that 2.7 million people will be infected and probably 85,000 uh, will die. I think that's low. I think it's going to be more than that. But now remember, uh, the, the estimations range from 100,000 dead to 1 million. Now, one death is, is, is a tragedy. Um, but it, if, if we contain this to 100,000 deaths, it will be declared a, quote, victory. And again, oh. no, no amount of deaths are, are acceptable. Yeah. This is not the Spanish flu. We have a very good intensive care system. What we do not have is a good supply chain. After the SARS uh, uh, scare in China, they cranked up their supply chain and manufacturing uh, ability. Today, 85% of our antibiotics come from overseas. Ironically, two of the largest production sites are in China and Italy. Today, this morning, I counted 156 essential drugs that I have to have to run an intensive care unit or crash cart. Most of these are coming from overseas, and 20 of these are in critical shortages. It's going to be tragic if we have uh, testing supplies here and do not have the reagents to, to, to make them work. Now, we all know that we have heard uh, about a week ago that Abbott has a five minute test. And that's gonna be a game changer for Montgomery. Right now we're stacking up people in the hospital. We put them in uh, quarantine isolation uh, rooms because we don't know. We, we think they may, but whatever. If I can get a five minute test, that's gonna change a, a lot. And that's gonna also help the uh, uh, protective, uh, the, uh, the personal protective equipment, like they, they, these masks that we, we're trying to, to wear. Uh, just last week, we mandated that all nurses uh, in the hospitals wear some time, even if, uh, some type of mask, even if it's a bandana, it, it helps somewhat. Uh, what are the, um, when will this be over and what are the, fa the financial ramifications? First of all, a lot of doctor's offices, we're small business people too, a lot of them are horribly strained just as y'all are. Uh, overheads from, from most doctor's offices range probably to 70 to 75%. Primary care doctors are in, in bad shape. Um, um, so we're right with you. Now, when is this going to be over? And people say, well, I'm not seeing many cases. It's not going to be uh, bad. It's a scare tactic, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I'm a fisheries biology major. I'm going to give you my fish pond example. You uh, put one lily pad in a fish pond. It doubles every day. It takes 60 days to consume that pond, OK? How, many, how much that pond is consumed uh, after uh, 59 days? Only half. What percentage is consumed after 54 days? Only 1%. The point I'm trying to make is you're fine until you're not fine. Our state is two to three weeks behind New York, and you see what's happening there. Uh, last Friday, uh, Auburn gave out a ventilator, and very close today. So we're finding a real war in the intensive care unit. Uh, the next 30 days are critical for Alabama. I asked the governor last, last uh, week to have a statewide shutdown and universal masking. Even homemade masks will do. A single infected person who goes on uh, and works uh, unabated uh, for 30 days will infect 440 people. Now, what will a 30-day isolation accomplish? Why are we doing this? This virus dies out in seven to four days. It has to have a, a living creature to spread to or it will die. That's why the 30 days deal. It's impossible. I know we can, the whole world can't shut down for 30 days. But if it did, this virus would be totally 100% gone in 30 days. Now, that's not going to happen. We're doing the best we can. Uh, vaccines. This is not going to be over until we have a vaccine. It takes 8 to 10 years to develop a, a vaccine uh, on the average. This one is going at warp speed. Today, the first testing uh, started. Uh, Bill Gates, I saw yesterday, is devoting, I think, several, I think said $4 billion to build the factories. This is forward thinking. Building the factories and whichever these nine companies develop the vaccine, he's got a factory for, for each one of them, and that's what we need. Now, this is, gonna, this is not going to be over in 30 days, okay? What do we do? Well, when the 30 days are over, we're going to have to let people go back to work. We're going to have to do it smart. We're going to have to have bold leadership from the city, the, the, the county, the state and the, and the nation uh, 
when we go back to work, it's going to be with social distancing, with masks, and we have to uh, tap the brake if we see communities that are getting hot again. We have to do some quarantine. We can't shut this uh, economy down the whole year. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll die. What is going to happen? This is going to be severe financial ramifications. It's hurting everybody. Um, I think my time is up, so I am going to uh, quit, and I'll answer any questions if I can later. Sorry I talked so fast. No, you're great. And Dr. Thrasher, thank you so much. I mean, your expertise is definitely appreciated. And I think that was really great information um, for us, a lot to absorb. And I know this has changed our, our way of life, not just for now, but um, definitely moving forward into the future. Um, you know, as we all sort of navigate our new normal, um, Willie, you know, as a small business owner yourself, I, I know, I see you're in your office there, so I, I know you're still working hard for your clients and for the people that you serve, but a question for you is, you know, individually, how are you maintaining sort of that business continuity, and um, as you work with your clients, how are you um, yourself, and, and how are you conveying to them um, how to stay optimistic in, in light of what Dr. Thrasher just shared with right. us. Right. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for the opportunity to participate. Uh, thank the chamber for doing this. Um, in 1968, Robert Kennedy was given a speech and he opened up by saying, may we live in interesting times. And it's very interesting times we're living in right now. Not only are there interesting times, but it's dangerous times, it's times of creativity. And it's just uh, right now, it's a, a difficult time for everybody. Um, many times as a small business owner, we feel that we're on an island, we are here by ourselves, and many times that's not the, the case at all. And I think the Chamber for connecting us to give us resources to be able to help us through this together. Um, my time, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing for business continuity. Um, as a State Farm Insurance Agency, we have to be prepared for catastrophe because if a tornado hits, sometimes we're wiped out as well. So we are mandated that we have to have a contingency program, a business continuity program, that if a tornado hit Montgomery and my business was destroyed, well, that's when I'm supposed to be helping my clients as well. So I need to have a backup plan, a plan just in case life happens. So it didn't, but we never had a plan like this, a plan that, this is impacting everybody. It's impacting everybody. It's not a tornado. It's not a hurricane. It's not a fire. This is something that we've never seen during our lifetime. Um, business disruption has gone on, whether it was Pearl Harbor, whether it was 9-11, whether it was the recession of 08. This would just be one of those other things that they were using case studies in some school of business at Harvard or something. How do we deal with it? Well, we're dealing with it by the three C's I'm talking about this morning or this afternoon. Uh, the first one is communication. I think it's important for every small business to communicate, whether you're communicating with your employees, because right now there's confusion. They're wondering, am I going to have a job? Will we continue to come back from this? How's my pay? What impact is having on my family? So we have to communicate, not only with our employees, but we also are communicating with our customers. Uh, I got a lot of tags or IMs or questions because some insurers are starting to give back premium back to their customers during this time because people are sheltering in place. They're not driving as often. So the company is saying, we don't have as many potential accidents. People are not driving as much. So we're looking at ways to return premium back to our customers. And I think State Farm would do some of that. We're evaluating right now, but we got to communicate with our employees and we got to communicate with our customers. We also, as business owners, have to communicate with our suppliers because revenues are not coming in. We're slowing our 30, 60, 90 day payments that now we're downstream impacting people. So communication is one thing I encourage us to uh, communicate. The other thing is we got to make some tough choices. Uh, business may not look the way it did prior to this happening. We got to be creative we got to make some tough choices. A lot of our team members are working remotely. And maybe prior to this happening, people never considered that as an option. But we got to make some tough choices as business owners. And every business got to look within themselves to see how can I better serve my customers, my clients, whether that's 
curbside services, whether that's now um, e-services, whether that, how does that look for your business? So not only do we communicate, not only do we make tough choices, but the last one I think is most important is we gotta be committed. Um, and that's difficult during this time. We gotta be committed. Uh, an ex example I like to share with you that I thought was humorous is, uh, I saw a gentleman once that had a belt on and suspenders at the same time. He wasn't committed to either one of them. He didn't believe in the belt and he didn't believe in the suspenders, so he wore both of them. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to be committed to how we move forward. And some people are traditionalists, they're stuck in their way, they can't visualize doing something different. But I think you have to do something different during this time. And last thing I'll say is, uh, um, I learned a long time ago, and then probably this is still in some of your thunder, is uh, having a bail team. Uh, every business owners need to communicate with their bail team. Uh, a banker, there's monies out there for the PPP program. We need to communicate with our accountant to gather papers and kind of help us with our P&L. Communicate with your insurance guy. Are there some discounts? Is there something we can do? Can we suspend my policies? And then we need to communicate problems with our lawyers to see, uh, you know, is there anything I need to be aware of during this time? So I would say communicate. I would say make tough choices. And then I would say be committed during this time. And just like 9-11 passed, just like 2008, just like Hurricane Katrina, just like Pearl Harbor, we'll come back stronger and better than before. Thank you. Thank you so much, Willie. Great, great feedback. Um, Nan, kind of to that point also to you about business continuity, um, you know, I know you also have a client base that you work closely with, and um, I'm sure that you are getting all kinds of questions right now about all kinds of different things. And, um, you know, a, a question for you is, again, sort of same as Willie, how are you navigating this um, from your business standpoint? And then as you work with your clients, um, especially with regard to some of that ever evolving information about resources and updates and guidance and shelter in place, but you can do this and that, or, you know, here are these relief packages. Um, you know, how are you sort of advising your, your client base uh, to navigate that during this time? Well, Willie, I think you need to come to work for me. I like the way you think. Um, <laughs> You're dead on. You're dead on about the things that we need to be doing. This is an unprecedented times and it makes me think a lot about my depression era daddy. He lived through those times and those of us who are alive now and old enough to do anything at all don't know those times, but I think we are going to need to pull back onto those kind of resources, that sort of mindset, that sort of frugality that we're not used to doing. We've been operating on a world of plenty in a world of, of productivity in a world of excess for a long time. And I think in the business community, we're gonna have to tighten our belts. We're gonna have to tighten up. We're gonna have to analyze our things and our money and our activities and our purchasing differently. We're gonna learn how to spend less is what is gonna hurt our economy in the long run, but it's just gonna have to be for us all to survive as a people. Um, for my company, we are all working remotely, and I am incredibly grateful for the opportunity of technology to be able to do that. The phone rings in my office, and it rings on everybody's cell phone. We can move phones around. People don't know that they're not calling the office. Of course, they do know we're not, but we can function as if we were there. And so we're able to communicate in a way that's helpful and, and uh, continuous. I, I bounce off of what you said, Willie, and... Um, Laura, this is, if you don't have a relationship with a banker and an attorney and an accountant, this is not a plug for my 40 year old Associated Business Services, but it is a plug for practical business best practice. That, that what I'm finding the people that are struggling the most are the ones who have been winging it on their own because they didn't want to pay somebody to do their books and they didn't want to pay somebody to tell them how to, when to, how to borrow money and how to work that. Because right now you need to be budgeting. 
You need to be doing a burn analysis. You need to be looking at your outgoing cash and your receivables and your payables. And you need to do some analysis. You need to be thinking about where I can cut, how I can negotiate. Can I get my landlord to back off the April rent, put it on the back end of my lease? How, what can I do, Willie? I wouldn't have thought about insurance premiums. What can I do to be able to save cash and to organize my spending and to make it happen in a way that I've never had to before. It's not a way that we are used to thinking and it's not a way that we want to think, but it, those businesses that are going to survive are going to be those businesses that adjust. And the reality is there's going to be some businesses who thrive on the other side of this because they learned hard lessons in hard times. So I would say that's my biggest advice is work with professionals, work with people who can help you. Now, Laura, the, the um, loans that are out there, our federal government has done an amazing job. Throw your politics out. They have done an amazing job of trying to take care of people. They realize in a fast way that small business is the backbone of this country. And if they don't prop us up, then it's gonna be bad news for everybody. And so these stimulus packages that they've put out there are, while good, they are a long way from perfect. And the guidance that we're getting changes every single day. And a lot of it is open to interpretation by the banks. And so if you are a small business with payroll, you've got some decisions to make whether or not to lay off your people and let them pay, draw unemployment and the federally boosted unemployment or whether you want to hold on to them and pay them and apply for a federal payroll protection program loan. It's a case by case decision. And it's something that you need to do some careful thinking about and work through. And then the other loan is called the emergency injury disaster loan. And there's some different, altogether different rules for that, but it is an ability or a way for the federal government to get some cash in the small business owner's hands. None of that money on either one of them has started. It's a hit yet. The application process for one of them had just opened up on Friday. The other one is we have been able to file online for about a week, but there's not been any cash to be able to be distributed yet. But you need to know what's out there so that you can make good decisions. If you just operate, shut down my doors today and say, I'm going to sit here and play video games until it comes time to go back to work, then you're going to be out of business when the time comes to go back to work. You've got to be working harder in this time than you worked when things were good and you were when you were doing the things you do. Now, obviously, I work with a range of businesses from the little guy who fixes cars to the, a, a guy with 300 employees who's doing manufacturing and those things. So I'm seeing it at a whole lot of different levels in a way that and everybody at those levels are obviously gonna handle it and make different decisions. So it's a case by case decision and thought process, but the, but the basics are the same. Budgeting, cash flow forecasting, collect my receivables, see what I can do about my payables, negotiate my rent or my lease, talk to my vendors, talk to the people that I do business with. Everybody's in the same boat. Everybody is trying to scramble and figure it out. So work together, communication, Willie, work together with your team and with the people and your stakeholders in your business. And the, for those people who are able to keep their employees and to be able to work remotely, be grateful to your people, work hard for your people, communicate with your people. Just but we, what we found with our team is that we can all work and do fine working remotely. There's 11 of us across and some, some of my employees are not in Alabama. Many of them are not in Alabama. So we decide we have to be conscious about coming together and talking through the issues that we might would yell down the hall for, but we still have things that we need to do because if, if I'm working on a problem and somebody else is working on a problem, then we've got two sets of man hours solving the same problem and that's just foolish. So we need to be careful in those remote situations to communicate well with each other too. We can survive this, we can thrive in this. It's gonna be over someday, but we need to not just treat it as business as usual, we need to work hard. Thank you, Nan. I think that's great advice for, for so many people trying to navigate this, especially from a, a, a bottom line standpoint. Um, I, I do have a couple questions that have come through and uh, some are, are targeted for specific panelists. Um, so Dr. Thrasher, this first one is actually for you. Um, should we be using home delivery from restaurants and grocery stores, or is the danger of coming into contact with a few people in those in-person transactions every few days really okay? 
Yes, it's really okay, and we absolutely should uh, to keep our local businesses going. Well, what I do uh, when we get this, I take it in, put it inside, I go wash my hands, okay? Uh, if you want to wear gloves, that's fine too. Uh, we do know that the virus can stay on stainless steel and uh, plastic, uh, maybe up to seven days. It's probably possibly infectious for, for two days on, on, on cardboard and paper. It's a, it's a matter of hours before it's gone. And we still don't know it just because it's on cardboard or, or paper whether it's infected, but absolutely support our local businesses here and you're safe. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, Willie, got one for you on leadership. Um, you know, obviously leading teams can be difficult at, at any time, but given the evolving nature of this crisis, leadership seems to be even more important. How do I make sure I'm leading for my team when there's so much uncertainty around me every day? Great question. Uh, I use the acronym CEO. Uh, most of us think of that as the chief executive officer. Um, but my twist on it is, uh, I think we need to provide clarity during this time uh, because there's a lot of ambiguity, a lot of doubt, a lot of unknown. So uh, part of leadership is providing clarity. Uh, the E is being the example. Um, we need to be the example for our team, whether we're working remotely or whether we're in office. Um, and then the O is need to be optimistic. We can't be woe is me, why is this happening? I just opened the doors, we just expanded, we just hired two new people. Be optimistic about it. Uh, and, and I think you know, your, your team follow you when you're that way, when you're providing right. clarity, when you're providing the example, when you're being optimistic. This right. is not gonna last all the time. It's not gonna be this way. We're gonna come out stronger. So that's what I would say as a leader. Um, we gotta play the hand with them. Nan, did you wanna expand on that? I think that's so right. You know, your team functions based on what trickles down. And if you are, if you are operating on a um, sense of adventure, hey, we've never done it this way before. We've never worked from home before. We've never been remotely. We've never had to be this tight with our budget before. We've never had to count the screws that we used on this project before. We've never done those. If we can make it, make it be a project, an adventure, a team effort. If I don't want to be the guy who makes all the decisions for my team, I want my team to prop me up and us make decisions together that affect all of us. And so we have daily team meetings and I want us to be able to work to do this together because they lots of times have better ideas than me. And that's I think right. that's true no matter what business you're in. And that's that's been a lesson, hard lesson for me to learn because in the old school business management, we were the boss, you know, and we were that thing. The new school business management is that, no, we we got to be a team approach. And so I think that's your, your dead on there, really. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Dr. Thrasher, this one might be in your lane, um, but anyone can maybe speak to this one. Um, we've heard about financial and economic ramifications, but can anyone speak to maybe the mental or physical ramifications of isolating and um, the lack of human interaction? Well, I'm certainly not a psychiatrist, but it is huge. And let me just say that 20% of the cases uh, as of last week of infected COVID patients in Alabama healthcare workers. So we are, we're, we are seeing this every day with these brave nurses and restaurant therapists. It's incredibly stressful and it's incredibly stressful for uh, people at home. <laughs> I heard yesterday, I, two predictions. First of all, I think I have a lot of babies come Christmas time. And the second prediction is uh, what, 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 in China, the, the divorce rate's going up. So, you know, you know, try to have more babies and don't get divorced, but uh, it is stress. And we, we, and that's where the churches can come in so much. I, I, I've reached out to several of our churches and said, look, missions are important overseas. I get it, okay? But these next 12 months will be so important to our people here. I would encourage them to look at their mission budgets, direct them to their, their local people. We gotta take care of people, uh, financially take care of them and also mentally take care of them. Excellent. And I know um, before the call, Nan and I also discussed those parents out there who are potentially working remotely or working, um, you know, adjusted hours and also homeschooling. So the, uh, the mental may not be isolation. It might be um, juggling. Yeah. <laughs> right. Certainly. Right. Um, 
Willie or Nandy, do you guys want to take a stab at that one at all, or I feel like Dr. Parker covered it? I, th I think he's right, but I have another another angle on that. You know, um, I have been in my house for for almost two weeks. I haven't been outside, and I can if I don't fight it and and work with people. We are in three Zoom Bible study groups a week, and I, that is my lifeline because I could see how after two months of this or three months of this, I'd be afraid to go outside my house again. I can see how personality disorders can develop out of this. And I, I think that has to be a conscious thought. No, this is temporary. Tell me it's temporary. Yeah. Nick, I'll, can, just, can, oh, I'll just say have this. Have interaction I think with I, other people. Find some way. Yeah. Some way to have it. Yeah, I, and I even think the, the the terminology that needs to be reversed and not social distancing, but physical distancing, because we still need the social interaction. Oh, very good. That's right. So it's Dr. Thrasher. Maybe we call it physical distancing, because I, I like I like that a lot. Really, we need the social I, interaction. Um, this technology, Zoom, uh, is fun. I mean, and I'm, I imagine there's other people doing this technology, but I think we all need each other at some form of interaction. So we don't need to become hermits and, and become introverts. We need social interaction, but we need physical distancing. But isn't there, isn't there a flip side to all that, that, that we can be, um, we can learn a lot and game with our families and be able to make turn lemonade out of lemons and some of this with our family situations or relationships too. Dr. Thrasher, did you want to close this out on that one? Well, well, I agree with them, but I also want to say it's very important that we do get outside. Take a walk. It's, t it's totally safe, okay? Totally safe. Go out there, exercise. You don't just sit in that chair, you know, for the next 30 days. It, it, we we got to work on our physical health and with our mental health. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've been in Bible study for, for 30 years, uh, every Tuesday morning at 7 o'clock that uh, I'm not going to. Uh, we, we're trying to do some some zoom in, but it's, I agree with you. It's not the same. Uh, call your friends. Tell them you love them. Say, uh, say what's happening. Excellent. Um, Nan, I've got one for you down here. I've actually got two that I'm going to choose between. Um, they're sort of similar to each other. You know, you mentioned the importance, and, and so did Willie, of working with um, a, a sort of group of experts, basically on your business, whether that be legal or, you know, tax advice or having a banking relationship, those types of things. Um, but if a business has not been as proactive on that front and um, is now sort of looking to beef up in, in one or all of those areas, do you have any advice? Is there any hope of getting help and access at this point? Um, what would your advice be to someone who is trying to do some outreach at, at this juncture um, in time? Several things. One is talk to people who you know that you respect and ask who they deal with and what their relationships have been and what their experience has been. There's everybody you know has, has been, anybody's in business has had to deal with this dilemma and to find that out. And there's ways to, to network and find those out. And for us, the way that we try to help people with that is that we hold a network meeting once a month. Um, once a month at Gateway Baptist Church, I cook lunch and we invite business owners and representatives to come in and eat lunch and to network. We've been doing it for 11 years and that gives businesses opportunities to just meet each other. And there's usually bankers there. There's Willie's been there. There's all kinds of people in there so that you can meet people in your realm that you might see that I have a need for that services, either professional or otherwise, but then just get out there and talk to people and see what's out there. Um, every, you know, you, the people that you work with need to be a good fit for you. They need to be the kind of professional. You don't need a real estate lawyer to ha set up your, to do some other things. You need, you need a, a, a small business accountant. You don't need the guy that does government work. You don't need, there's, you need to find the right fit in the professional arena for what your needs are. And those people are there. You just need to network and find them. And, um, We'd love to talk to, to anybody that needs some help. I'm, I will help you point in the direction of the people that I know that might be helpful if you'd like to ask those questions. Uh, Willie, do you have anything on that front? I know that's something you mentioned as well. Montgomery Area Chamber of Commerce, the 60 minute oh, coffees, the business mm -hmm. after hours. I mean, that yeah. is exactly the purpose of those, to be able to build relationships, network, and pass out business cards. And Nan hit it. 
Um, I think also people you trust. Uh, uh, I, I don't, um, I, I, I be careful how I say it. When people go to Facebook and put in search of a insurance agent, I feel that I didn't do a good enough job because you have to go and sit in search of. Hopefully somebody on my timeline would say you need to call Willie. But everybody knows somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody. That's right. So, so and that's what I got. Yeah. I have go to ahead. put a plug. Um, you know, that's what we do. We're, we're here to connect people and resources. And um, we do hope that people will take advantage of that. That is, that is you know, our entire purpose of existing is, is to connect folks and to really um, you know, help Montgomery grow and, and really endure things like this. So thank you, Willie, for um, <laughs> Chairman's hat there for a second. Yes. <laughs> um, Dr. Thrasher, I do have one more for you, um, and I, I think we can do one more after that, and then we'll, we'll move to close. But um, routine medical care. So if, if you are, um, if you had or have um, appointments that are scheduled coming up for some, some routine medical care or procedures, um, you know, what should your plans be on that front while all of this is going on? Great question. Uh, what we're doing, uh, we're spending most of our day and uh, half of our night sometimes in, in the hospital, but uh, we, the patients that are supposed to see me this week, uh, I bring the charts, uh, a lot of time I bring them home, I call them. We're doing telemedicine, uh, Blue Cross and, and Medicare has made that uh, uh, very helpful to the patients out there, do not go uh, to your doctor. Call your doctor. If it's routine, put it off, okay? Uh, call and, and talk to him, and hopefully they're already doing the telemedicine calling and make sure you're doing okay, checking your prescription, telling you about what to uh, uh, avoid with the COVID, et cetera, et cetera. But now is not the time to go do anything routine. These next 30 days are critical. If we can shut this thing down in 30 days, we're going to save a lot of lives and a lot of businesses. Excellent. Um, I've had a lot of people ask that question, so th thank you for that. Um, I've got one to close us out, actually. Uh, so I think we all have, you know, had to evolve and innovate, basically, in what we've done. We certainly have at the Chamber. Um, Dr. Thrasher, it sounds like you guys have with uh, working through the whole shift to telemedicine and phone calls. Um, you know, what has that looked like for, for each of you? And has that been a smooth transition or has that been a, a scurry to find resources and, and figure out what technology you need to use? Um, and, and Nan, I might start with you because I, I know you've used Zoom for quite some time, um, but you know, what, other, what other tools are you using right now to, to try to stay, stay connected and, and continue to function? Are you innovating at all sort of anything? Yeah. Yeah, we um, have had people working remotely for a long, long time, but everybody in our office wasn't. So about three weeks ago, I decided it was time to ramp up and get everybody where they could work at home. So we got that ready. By the time it came, became obvious that we needed to do that, we were ready. But another tool we usually, we're using that's been real fun is called Slack. And it's an internal um, communication thing where we can talk real time. And if you're not having to email and answer an email back and forth, we can talk. We have channels where there's a general channel that everybody can see it, or there's you can talk privately to one somebody else and get an answer real time and do that. And that has felt, helped us to be um, connected and to be productive. It's been a really good tool. There's a lot. There's other ones out there like that. Microsoft Teams, I think, is one of them that comes with with um, Office 365. Mm -hmm. um, and our technology company, you know, ABS Technology, they have some real neat things that they've worked out for uh, for particular people as they were setting up their remote access at home. They have some real fun tools that I don't get involved in, but I know there's a lot of other ones out there. Gotcha. Uh, Willie, have you guys uh, been doing anything on your end to to meet the challenge from a distance? Great question. Um, because again, our industry, we have to plan for war in the time of peace. So we have to have things in place just in case tornado that hit in Nashville, if it destroys your office, you got to still be able to take care of your clients. So we had things in place. What I've done is, is um, when you have a small business, you become family. And our team enjoy coming in, but I want to make sure they feel safe. So we've locked the doors. No clients can come in. We can do business over the phone. We can do business via the app. We can do business via the website. So there's other ways we can transact business. But we're more here for mental health 
and get away from the wife and the kids than anything else. <laughs> gotcha, <laughs> don't gotcha. you tell her I said that either. <laughs> <laughs> And, and Dr. Thrasher, you mentioned some of the, the telemedicine um, shift, and, and you mentioned that Blue Cross has gotten behind that. Um, you know, the shift in, in the, you know, medical industry seems to, to be going quickly. Can you expand on that a little bit? It has been going very quickly, and uh, uh, I, I think once you let the cow out of the barn, it's not going to go back. I think uh, people that I've been calling are very grateful, very happy, and uh and you can do a lot by just talking to somebody, examining them, going for their medication, whatever. Uh, so I think this is going to be a, something that's going to go in the, the future. It's not going to be shut down when we uh, kill this virus. Gotcha. Well, um, I think we are almost out of time. So I will actually ask each of you if there is one thing that you would like to leave our audience with today. What would that one takeaway be? And uh, Willie, I'll start with you on that. Well, actually, I got this from Nan on this uh, call here. Um, to make it fun, kind of a scavenger hunt, make it adventurous, we, we gotta stay positive as opposed to the woe is me. So I think look for ways to be innovative. In the Marines, we talked about adapt, adjust, improvise, overcome. But to make it almost fun while you're doing it. So we're going to become more adventurous, Nan. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, Nan, how about you? I think that if we plan for today, this is the way I operate life as a rule. I don't plan for today. I'm planning for next week all the time. And I think that's all that more important right now. I'm not planning for today. I'm figuring out what I'm going to need next month and, and the month after that. And I think small business owners typically operate in the moment. And in the, what I have to do, put out the fires that are burning the hottest. I think we have to get out of that mindset and get into a planning and proactive mode. That's great. Good advice. That's great. Um, and Dr. Thrasher, how about you? Well, my glass is always half full. My wife says I'm, I'm too big optimist. So being a critical care doctor, if I'm not <laughs> optimistic, I, I'm in, in bad shape. We're going to get through this, absolutely. And if the people would do what they're doing now, the last couple of days have been huge. People will, will shut down, give this 30 days a, a, a try, and then get back to business smartly, social di distancing, uh, the mask, all that stuff, and gradually survive until we get this vaccine. The business is going to come roaring back. There are going to be industries we haven't thought about. The stock market is going to boom. And I told many people, when you see that that vaccine is ready to be uh, had, I'm going to throw every dime I got in the stock market. It is going to be a great time for America. Yay. Yay. That's, yes. that's an excellent note to end on for sure. And, <laughs> I'm um, not a stockbroker now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we all look forward to those days, I know. And, um, I just I want to thank you all again uh, for joining us today. Great discussion, a, a fun group, and, and I think uh, each one of you brings a unique perspective to us. So we certainly appreciate it and um, hope we can continue to, to partner with you all as we, we move forward. Um, I do want to say, uh, Willie, you made a good point that at the Chamber, you know, we all we want to do right now is, is bring resources to not only our members, but we, we see ourselves playing a role in the community as well. So I do want to throw out that uh, resources page on our website one more time. It's montgomerychamber.com slash COVID-19. You'll find a, a wealth of information there, including some of those tools that uh, Nan and, and others talked about. So uh, check that out. Um, I also want to mention, uh, you know, Willie also mentioned some of our networking activities that become a little difficult when we have to practice social distancing. So we are working uh, very hard to innovate around those events really? and bring some of those to you and some, some new and that exciting. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, we will be posting continuous updates about that on our events page. Um, and the next event we have coming up through sort of our, our business studio programming will be a five part series with Tasha Scott, who owns uh, Maximize Growth. That will be on Tuesdays and Thursdays at noon, starting this Thursday. You can sign up for that on our website at montgomerychamber.com slash events, or check it out on Facebook. And the title of that series is Stay Strong, Lead Well. So with that, um, again, thank you guys, and uh, have a wonderful, safe day.